appreciate that. Well, it is, uh, I'm so excited to be here. I can kind of just sense the energy in this room of a bunch of creatives and entrepreneurial-minded folks that are here to just go out and make good and big things happen, and I'm here for that. And I am uh, very, very passionate about the topic I get to share with you tonight, which is to dream big, but to take action against that and to start small. And I'm going to have three parts. The first part is going to be just a little personal story of like how I got here. The second part is taking that philosophy of dreaming big and starting small and how do we create a new story with that and then how have we innovated since. And the third part is to just encourage y'all uh, to really get started on whatever dream that you have on your heart. So I'm going to use a new story tonight as the example. That's what I'm lucky to do today. But growing up, starting a nonprofit like New Story was about the last thing I thought I would do. Now, I was fortunate to have amazing parents. They instilled great values in me. A lot of that came from the church. But this whole, like, putting others before yourself and faith thing, it wasn't that appealing to me. I thought it was boring, not ambitious, not adventurous. And I would just like miss out on all the joy and the fun in life if I was doing that. And I thought I had a pretty good trick up my sleeve because I knew in the grand scheme of things, a bigger purpose and God was probably important. And so I was just like, okay, I'll punt that till I'm like 50 or 70 or maybe hack the whole thing and figure it out like right before I die. Because I thought living with a bigger purpose than myself couldn't possibly be better than living my way. So with that lens, throughout high school and college, a little bit of time when I lived in Atlanta, I was chasing after what I call the three Gs. And it's not generosity and gratitude and God. No, it was gold, glory, and girls. Which turns out, when those are top priority, it's just unfulfilling. And so here I was in Atlanta in my early 20s. I wasn't depressed. I wasn't rock bottom. I was just confused. And I was longing for a more meaningful life. Now, people get there in all different ways. But my personal story, it happened through a revived Christian faith here in Atlanta over at Buckhead Church. And that just changed my heart, changed my values, gave me clarity. I made a total 180, and that sent me down on a trip to Haiti. And I went down there a couple years after the 2010 earthquake, where hundreds of thousands of homes were destroyed, forcing families to grow up without one of life's most basic human needs, safety and shelter. And I was there firsthand. I could, I could see, I could feel the oppressive heat, the overwhelming smell that families were just used to. Saw kids that slept restlessly on dirt floors. I met mothers that told stories of that when it rained at night, mud and sewage would rush through the floor. And so they would have to stand up holding their child in their arms. And I could see how the one place that we all want and better yet deserve to feel safe was actually a breeding ground for disease and sickness. And we believe that in 2019, with all the advancements we have in our world, no human being and no child should live like this. And that's what New Story is on mission to change. So I got back from Haiti, uh, but I was only 24. I never expected to start anything like this. I had zero qualifications. And frankly, I had a lot of bad previous experiences with other charities. For the most part, I thought there was a lack of transparency, accountability, and the biggest gap I saw was a lack of focus on innovation. And so there was this like obvious problem, which was kids in a tent. And then there were all these other problems that I saw that then caused me to kind of zoom out and from an entrepreneurial perspective say, hey, what if we could try to solve those problems? And what if we could create an organization that would just be founded on doing things differently? 
And so I started small. And I met Matthew, and I met Allie, and we became co-founders at age 24, just a few millennials, master planning, not how we'd go and change the world, but how we would fund our first house. So how did we start small and get those first few houses funded? Well, we had a vision for creating a better experience of giving, and we wanted to create this like scalable crowdfunding platform that would connect donors all around the world digitally to a family in need, so you can go online, you could see their picture, you could read their story. 100% of that donation would go towards building their house, built by local workers, using local materials. When the families move into their new home, they would take a move-in video on one of the best days of their lives, and we would send it back to everybody that made it happen. That was the dream. Now, mind you, we didn't have any money. We didn't really have that much time. We had full-time jobs. And we didn't have a software engineering team to build that platform. Maybe how some of you feel right now. And so then, how did we start it? Well, the politically correct answer, or probably what I'm supposed to say, is that we went out and we aggregated a multitude of software solutions and complied with all API regulations to make a site. The real answer is that we just faked it all. We digitally duct taped a crowdfunding website. And this is how it worked. You would come online and you would donate, right? You, this is a screenshot from the very early days of News Story. You would donate, and when you donated, there was no back end code or tech that would automatically update everything. What was on the back end? It was me and my co-founders carrying our computers everywhere, and we would pull out our computer after a donation, and we would go on almost as a PowerPoint page, and we would manually move the meter from here to here, and then we would calculate the percentage, and then we would copy and paste a green emoji and throw it on there, and then we would hit refresh, and then the page would refresh. We did that for hundreds, almost a thousand donations. People, y'all, people would call and email and be like, hey, uh, we donated, did that go through? Because we didn't really see the meter move. And we would say, oh, Sally, credit card processing takes you know, a couple hours. Your donation did go through. We'll get it updated, we got it. And then we would update it. Now, there was integrity in the donations, but we did kind of put this front on of the interface. And the lesson is that we had a hunch of what could be and what should be better from an experience, and then we went out at pretty much no money at all, and we proved that this was something people wanted. With that momentum, we went out on a limb, and we applied to Y Combinator. For context, that's the world's top startup accelerator. They've produced companies such as Airbnb, Dropbox. Um, we applied knowing that about one to two percent of applicants would make it in. There were about 10,000 startups that applied. Well, against all odds, we got in. We became one of the first nonprofits to go through Y Combinator. We moved from Atlanta to Silicon Valley. And I want to give you just a little example of the kind of peers that were out there with us. So I want to introduce you to somebody I met out there. All right? So, hey, what's up, man? Uh, what's your background? Oh, hi, Brett. I'm William. I spent my undergrad at MIT, then went to NASA, while at the same time I got my PhD from Oxford, and now my startup's creating a new cryptocurrency to compete against Bitcoin in Asia. How about you? Of course you are. Um, I went to Florida State, uh, you know, college football, Greek life. No. Oh. Um, and I'm just doing my best to fund some houses. Good luck, Brett. And I tell you that story because we had a big dream, but we were definitely underdogs on paper compared to our peers. But I believe our underdogness actually became our advantage. It gave us this sense of grit and tenacity and a creative mindset. And for me personally, it kind of forced me not to try to rely on my own ability but to just put more weight and trust in my faith and just you know, trust that I'm gonna go out, work hard with costly consistency, and if, if he wanted to make something happen, then good or bad, it would happen. In the last four years, I'm gonna give you about a one minute summary of what's happened. 
So we ended up funding that first house by, you know, digitally duct taping that whole experience. We then got obsessed. We worked harder. We started to build these neighborhoods. And that turned into what we do today, which is we build entire communities, hundreds of homes, thousands of people in each community. Usually there's a school, agriculture training, clean water involved. And from doing that first house, this is what our team has been able to do. We've now done over 2,600 homes, building 22 communities across Haiti, El Salvador, and Mexico. We've now done over $30 million in revenue. Um, Fast Company named us now twice as one of the most innovative social impact companies in the world. And our 3D printing project, which I'm about to get to, has now gotten over a billion online impressions. And we've done all that with our number one asset, which is our team and our culture, which has been our differentiator. We're based in San Francisco. We have a team and an office here in Atlanta. We're continuing to grow and hire here in Atlanta, if you want to check out our careers page. But our youth, our millennialness, see we're not all that bad, older folks, um, has, has been our advantage. And if you're here today and you feel like you're younger, you're inexperienced, that can be your advantage too, because you're going to see things differently than the old guard and the status quo. So we had this kind of differentiating dream, and I just, I had this conviction from the beginning that there needed to exist a more modern, innovative nonprofit. And one of those examples is the, the amount of focus that we put on R&D and risk-taking. We have a group of private donors that we call the builders, and they fund all of our innovation and our R&D. And that enables us to do things like invent a 3D printing machine that can print houses. Now, at this point, we're all familiar with 3D printing, right? We have them in our schools, our offices, our universities. So how new, how crazy is 3D printing homes actually? Well, for reference, here's the number of habitable permitted 3D printed homes in the world that we know of. And here's the one we created last year with our partner Icon. How it works, it's a little complicated, but uh, to explain it simply how I would share it with my mom is that uh, there is a proprietary cement mix that's oozing out of the nozzle and it's almost like soft serve ice cream, how it's coming out, and it's layering a built to last house. Now, this looks pretty cool, I get it, and we proved that it worked, but how did we start? We started small. This is me and a few of my team members in a random backyard at our partner Icon's place, back before anybody thought this was cool. Uh, we were just a few unqualified, crazy kids working on this. And the rare few that didn't know about it, they weren't encouraging us. They were saying, guys, come on, stick to what works. Let somebody else figure this out. You know, be a little more, be a little more normal. And the way we think about that as a team is that when there's about a billion people in the world that live in those conditions I showed you earlier, we don't need more normal. We desperately need more breakthroughs. And so we took a swing. The good news is that it worked. And we now have a mantra at News Story that your dream, however crazy it is, like whatever is on your heart right now, and you continue to think about it, it's only crazy until you go after it, and it's not. Now, this was never about one house. It was always a bigger vision. It was always for real families and 3D printing real communities. And I'm very proud to say after an extraordinary amount of challenges that we've overcome, we were on the verge of creating the world's first 3D printed community in 2019. And here's a one minute video of how it works and the design of the homes that will be printed.
Yes. So we are uh, being very secretive right now, but you will be seeing some pretty cool news later this year. Uh, fingers crossed, but it's, it's, it'll be coming out. So uh, you might be wondering, how can this like young team pull some of this stuff off? Well, it's definitely not because we have the most experience. It's not because we have the most money or the biggest budget. And it's not because we're the most intelligent team around. So then, why? What's the differentiator? And I just think it's something that's kind of simple and that everybody in here could apply. We are just crazy enough or unreasonable enough to actually believe we can do it and then take action against that dream. There's a phrase that I kind of refer to, and I think we've done a good job of trying to distance ourselves from this, and that's to beware of the soul-sucking force of reasonableness. And what I mean by this is that over the next you know, couple days here, y'all are going to get so jacked up on ideas and dreams, and then you're going to go back into the world, and there is going to be a very strong gravitational pull down to normalcy and reasonableness. Ah, we can't fund that. How would that look? We can't take that risk. But your advantage, if you're starting small, is that you don't yet have to really deal with bureaucracy, right? You could be unreasonable if you wanted to. And when I say unreasonable, I don't mean stupid or dumb. I mean unique. I mean different from the beginning and able to take calculated risk. Now, some of you here have a dream you're already working on, or maybe you're about to start, or if not, that's okay. But if you are wanting to start something and you have clarity on it, I have two really simple, like as simple as it gets, pieces of advice on what to do after Plywood Presents. The first thing is that it is 100% your choice if you want to start small on your dream or if you don't. And the good news is that it doesn't matter your background. It doesn't matter where your degree is from. It doesn't matter your skill set. You can still decide. And your competitive advantage will be that you made the choice to say yes, because the majority of other people just won't do it. Now, and if you're on the fence of not doing that, I understand. I've been there. I totally get it. These are two things that I think hold people up. The first is simply caring what other people think. If I post this video or this blog post, what are they going to think? And we let this room of talented people, sometimes we let other people's opinions rob our creativity and gifts to the world. Now, would some people criticize it? Of course. But if they do, to me, that's good. That means that you're on to something that's unique and worthwhile. And deep down, they're probably jealous that you actually had the courage to start. The second thing is a fear of hypothetical situations. And what this means is that it's today in 2019, and I'm thinking a year from now of, oh, what if we can't land that customer? Oh, what if I audition for the 10th time and I don't get it? I know what I'll do. I'll just play it safe. And we let those, that fear of hypotheticals hijack what could happen. Be. And I would just encourage you, don't let that rob the potential that you have. And what, what is the worst case anyways? If you're starting small, maybe the worst case is you lose a little bit of money, you lose a little bit of time, but actually in doing it, you're probably going to grow and get better anyways than if you didn't even start. And the last thing is after you've maybe made a choice that you want to start small, the next thing is, you guys, this is so simple. Set an achievable goal, not trying to go change the world. Set an achievable goal, commit, and give yourself no excuses. How we did that? I wanted to fund our first few homes. Very achievable. That was totally in my power to make happen. And you can do the same thing. Set a goal, put a deadline on it, no excuses, and commit to go getting that first win. Now, if you feel a little unqualified, welcome. That's exactly how you should feel. 
And I just want to encourage you that you can do what's on your heart. You can start small if you want to. So dream big and start small. Thank you.